Steph. 357 Republic 2. Socrates, Glaucon. With these words I was thinking that I had made an end of the discussion, but the end, in truth, proved to be only a beginning. For Glaucon, who was always the most pugnacious of men, was dissatisfied at Thrasymachus' retirement, he wanted to have the battle out. So he said to me, Socrates, do you wish really to persuade us, or only to see BTO have persuaded us, that to be just is always better than to be unjust? I should wish really to persuade you, I replied, if I could. The Threefold Division of Goods Then you certainly have not succeeded. Let me ask you now, how would you arrange goods, are there not some which we welcome for their own sakes, and independently of their consequences, as, for example, harmless pleasures and enjoyments, which delight us at the time, although nothing follows from them? I agree in thinking that there is such a class, I replied. See, is there not also a second class of goods, such as knowledge, sight, health, which are desirable not only in themselves, but also for their results? Certainly, I said. And would you not recognize a third class, such as gymnastic, and the care of the sick, and the physician's art, also the various ways of money-making, these do us good but we regard them as disagreeable, and no one would choose them for their own sakes, but only for the sake of some reward or result which flows from them? There is, I said, this third class also. But why do you ask? Because I want to know in which of the three classes you would place justice? 358 inches the highest class, I replied, among those goods which 37 he who would be happy desires both for their own sake and for the sake of their results. Then the many are of another mind, they think that justice is to be reckoned in the troublesome class, among goods which are to be pursued for the sake of rewards and of reputation, but in themselves are disagreeable and rather to be avoided. I know, I said, that this is their manner of thinking and that this was the thesis which Thrasymachus was maintaining just now, when he censured justice and praised injustice. But I am too stupid to be convinced by him. Three heads of the argument, 1. The nature of justice, 2. Justice a necessity, but not a good, 3. The reasonableness of this notion. Be I wish, he said, that you would hear me as well as him, and then I shall see whether you and I agree. For Thrasymachus seems to me, like a snake, to have been charmed by your voice sooner than he ought to have been, but to my mind the nature of justice and injustice have not yet been made clear. Setting aside their rewards and results, I want to know what they are in themselves, and how they inwardly work in the soul. If you please, then, I will revive the argument of Thrasymachus. Can first I will speak of the nature and origin of justice according to the common view of them. Secondly, I will show that all men who practice justice do so against their will, of necessity, but not as a good. And thirdly, I will argue that there is reason in this view, for the life of the unjust is after all better far than the life of the just if what they say is true, Socrates, since I myself am not of their opinion. But still I acknowledge that I am perplexed when I hear the voices of Thrasymachus and myriads of others dinning in my ears, and, on the other hand, I have never yet heard the superiority of justice to injustice maintained by anyone in a satisfactory way. I want to hear justice praised in respect of itself, that I shall be satisfied, and you are the person from whom I think that I am most likely to hear this, and therefore I will praise the unjust life to the utmost of my power, and my manner of speaking will indicate the manner in which I desire to hear you too praising justice and censuring injustice. Will you say whether you approve of my proposal? Indeed I do, nor can I imagine any theme about which a man of sense would oftener wish to converse. 38 Glaucon Yeah I am delighted, he replied, to hear you say so, and shall begin by speaking, as I proposed, of the nature and origin of justice. Justice a compromise between doing and suffering evil. They say that to do injustice is, by nature, good, to suffer injustice, evil but that the evil is greater than the good. And so when men have both done and suffered injustice and 359 have had experience of both, not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, 
they think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither, hence there arise laws and mutual covenants, and that which is ordained by law is termed by them lawful and just. This they affirm to be the origin and nature of justice, it is a mean or compromise, between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not be punished, and the worst of all, which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation, and justice, being at a middle point between the two, is tolerated not as a good, but as the lesser evil, and honored by reason of the inability of men to do injustice. Be for no man who was worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement if he were able to resist, he would be mad if he did. Such is the received account, Socrates, of the nature and origin of justice. Now that those who practice justice do so involuntarily and because they have not the power to be unjust will best appear cif we imagine something of this kind, having given both to the just and the unjust power to do what they will, let us watch and see whither desire will lead them, then we shall discover in the very act the just and unjust man to be proceeding along the same road, following their interest, which all natures deem to be their good, and are only diverted into the path of justice by the force of law. The liberty which we are supposing may be most completely given to them in the form of such a power as is said to have been possessed by Gyges, the ancestor of Croesus the Lydian one. The story of Gyges according to the tradition, Gyges was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia, there was a great storm, and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at the sight, he thirty-nine descended into the opening, where, among other marvels, he beheld a hollow brazen horse, having doors, at which he stooping and looking and saw a dead body of stature, as appeared to him, more than human, and having nothing on but a gold ring, Ethus he took from the finger of the dead and reascended. Now the shepherds met together, according to custom, that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king, Into their assembly he came having the ring on his finger, and as he was sitting among them he chanced to turn the collet of the ring inside his hand, when instantly he became invisible to the rest of the company and they began to speak of him as if he were no longer present. 360 He was astonished at this, and again touching the ring he turned the collet outwards and reappeared, he made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result, when he turned the collet inwards he became invisible, when outwards he reappeared. Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, where as soon as he arrived be seduced the queen, and with her help conspired against the king and slew him, and took the kingdom. The application of the story of Gyges supposed now that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them and the unjust the other, no man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take what he clicked out of the market, or go into houses and lie with anyone at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like a god among men. Then the actions of the just would be as the actions of the unjust, they would both come at last to the same point. And this we may truly affirm to be a great proof that a man is just, not willingly, or because he thinks that justice is any good to him individually, but of necessity. For wherever anyone thinks that he can safely be unjust, there he is unjust. For dull men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice, and he who argues as I have been supposing, will say that they are right. If you could imagine anyone obtaining this power of becoming invisible, and never doing any wrong or touching what was in others, he would be thought by the lookers-on to be a forty most wretched idiot, although they would praise him to one another's faces, and keep up appearances with one another from a fear that they too might suffer injustice. Enough of this.